we've come back to Discovery World on Milwaukee's Lake Michigan Lakefront. And I'm standing on the deck of a replica of the Challenge, a sailing vessel that ran aground in 1910 south of Sheboygan. In just a few minutes, we'll conclude our two-part series on Lake Michigan shipwrecks with a look at two more sunken vessels. But first, Elizabeth Kramer joins a group of adventuresome women for a National Wild Turkey Federation Women in the Outdoors program in Vernon County. I'm Dan Small, and it's time once again for Outdoor Wisconsin. Summer to fall, winter to spring, from Green Bay to where the same Croix sings, from Catamaran to Superior Shore, Outdoor Wisconsin, Outdoor Wisconsin. I'm in the Simple Machines shipyard where you can explore the six building blocks that are the basis of all complicated machines made today. And speaking of exploring, the National Wild Turkey Federation Women in the Outdoors program offers workshops for women to explore a variety of outdoor activities in a safe, supportive environment. Elizabeth Kramer spent a day at an event in Vernon County where she threw herself right into the fun. Today I am in Westby, Wisconsin with a group of women that is sure to inspire you to get outside. Join me for Women in the Outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 1997 was a pilot program in Wisconsin. Okay, so how many years have you guys been at it? 20... 22 years. Okay. Yep, 22nd year. Wow, and how much has the program grown since then? We originally had about 50 people at the first event, and since then we've been up to 180, and this year we've got 150 here. So it's it's grown a lot, and it's, it's become a really popular event with everyone. It's neat to be able to see all the women. They come here, they've never done this before. It's their first time, they're so excited, and they just go home with so many new experiences and new friends. We're doing new adventures every year. We do the climbing tower and the zip line. We do uh, shooting classes and fishing. We do kayak and canoeing. So there's always something new to offer them year over year. And I've also noticed a lot of women returning for their fourth, fifth, sixth year. What does that mean to you? It means we're doing something right. I pulled the first bow here in this spot mm -hmm. last time we were at this camp. I want to take this class again. I, all the pointers are important. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of maybe graduating to bow hunting turkey since I do that anyway with the gun. I'm here to get a refresher because I don't do it every day. <laughs> Look at that. I learned all about bows and archery here about seven or eight years ago when we were at this particular camp last, and I just loved it. Went home and bought a bow and joined the archery league and came back here with my daughter so she gets a chance to shoot my bow, so it's a lot of fun. There's so many, there's about half first-timers here this weekend, and it's, that's the real fun. It's just fun to watch them come for the first time and, and just you know, meet new people and just enjoy camps like this in the beautiful state of Wisconsin. We love it. Okay, what you have to do is you have to build a fire. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to collect little tiny sticks to make, make that. We'll use the, uh, the jute as our tinder, but get a whole bunch of little tiny sticks, make a little teepee, leave a door, a few more bigger sticks on top, and when you're ready for that, I'll set you up with a um, piece of char cloth and materials to light the fire. And so you gotta have a downward, little bit of a downward angle. Okay. okay and you're just gonna, glancing blows. Sometimes they hit the char cloth and they bounce right off. There you go. So I am here with John Clare, who is the conservationist of the year in Wisconsin. He just taught us how to build a fire, but he teaches so much more than that. John, how did you get involved with the Women in the Outdoors program? Um, I've been involved with the Turkey Federation since 1984. And when they started the Women in the Outdoors program 20 some years ago, my wife and I helped to get the first one started. And um, since I had taught outdoor stuff in the school, various schools that I taught at, um, I kind of got roped into being one of the first instructors. And I've been with it off and on for all 21 years. What we're building here is a debris hut. Uh, it's a survival shelter made out of all the different things we find on the forest floor. We don't kill anything. Um, 
to make this shelter, dead sticks that have fallen off the trees and leaves. And when we get uh, a layer of leaves where we want them, uh, we will put some more dead sticks over the top so that the next windstorm doesn't take our shelter with it. Um, very nice shelters. I've slept in them several times. Um, they shed water pretty well, uh, especially if you get a good thick layer of leaves. Um, and of course they will shed wind and other elements as well. We have made fire from scratch. Can you kind of tell us what it was like for you today? Challenging. What part was challenging? Again, the fire. That was probably the most challenging. And the stone. Getting the yeah. sparks to hit the yeah. right spot yeah. to ignite. And you, ha you still have to have the right materials to yeah. do that. But even with those right materials, it still was a bit of a challenge. Was challenging. I would have never tried this if I didn't come here because this is a comfortable surrounding. So right. even if I failed, exactly. I would have been okay with that. And it's okay to fail, yeah. and then because, we all work together. Yeah. To well, that's one of the great things about this event is that yeah. you can work together with complete strangers and and have a great time doing it and accomplish something wonderful. And you really bond. Anytime you learn anything new, it makes you more confident in life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In Overall, general. you could take John's class every year and you'd learn something yeah, new sure. every time. I'm sure. So to come out here and teach women things like the survival hike, what has that taught you? Well, it's, it's taught me that no matter where you come from or who you are, um, survival skills are fun, you know, and, and as a former science teacher, uh, it's science. You know, it's the fire science and survival of, um, of the different foods you can eat and the ones you can't because of the chemicals that are present. We talked earlier about the cattail being one of the big four. The big four are the four things you can always eat. Uh, uh, oaks, pines, cattails, and grasses. Those are always edible. This plant is called the jewel weed or touch me not. This is the cure for poison ivy. The inside, uh, that, that liquid in there can be rubbed on poison ivy and will take the itch away. It's all fun and it's all um, enjoyable and I just love seeing students of any age and any sex um, learning stuff. Every hand is up, you're gonna cushion if you fall, you're not gonna catch. Okay. Spotter ready. On belay. Belay is on. Climbing. Climb on. It just promotes bringing women together and just teaching them new things so they can share that with their families and their friends, like how to hunt and how to catch fish and everything like that, because not everybody grows up in a family that does it. And of course you're here with your mom, so what has this done for your relationship? <laughs> now, no starting early. Well, I think it's helped a lot, just because we've always been really close. All right, climbing? Climb on. Kind of like two peas in a pod, but <laughs> we kind of read each, other, each other's minds now that we've worked with this for so long and it's just it's been really good. Patty what I, do you think? I, I totally agree. <laughs> I, we, we do have a great relationship but she's matured so much since she started coming here um, and she's always been my helper. I mean no matter whether it be at home or working with women in the outdoors. Where have you seen her grow the most since you know seven years ago? Confidence. She has confidence. She's not afraid to say what's on her mind um, in positive ways. How did that make you feel, Mom, watching her? Proud. Very, very proud. She's an amazing young lady. She really is. And she's got a <laughs> awesome future ahead of her. Don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Two, one, go. <laughs> I love everything that this group promotes and is about. I just... The message of women in the outdoors is something that I want to continue to just carry on as long as I can. We'll tell you how to learn more about women in the outdoors programs later in the show. Right now I'm in the Great Lakes Ships History Exhibit where you can learn what happened to the Christmas tree ship the Ralph Simmons and some other ships that sailed the Great Lakes. Last week we brought you part one of a two-part series on Wisconsin's maritime history and Lake Michigan shipwrecks. Let's head back underwater now for the conclusion of this series as we explore two more wrecks and learn what's being done to preserve them. That's about the age Where I was, it? about there. 18, 19, something like that. For years I was the youngest guy on a lot of the rigs we worked on. When the shipwreck was happening, were you, were you scared? 
yeah, oh, of course. I thought, this is, this is not right. <laughs> you don't go out and go to work and expect to drown. The dredge had no business being out there as far as I'm concerned, but who was I? I was just a young guy. Dredge number six. It was built uh, by Manitowoc Shipbuilding and it was built to dredge. It was a pretty flat hulled vessel. Um, it had a big scoop on it. It was built for a company in Chicago, Fitzsimons and Connell. Um, and it was used essentially to dredge channels. In 1956, the Oak Creek Power Plant was just being built by uh, Wisconsin Electric. And they were in the process of building four different units for that power plant. And what they wanted to do was deliver the coal by water with full vessels, full Great Lakes vessels. But the channel at the dock, and there was a turnaround area, wasn't deep enough to allow those vessels to be filled with coal. So the dredge's job, it was hired to do, was to dredge the channel at the Wisconsin Electric Plant in Oak Creek deep enough to allow a full vessel of coal to deliver coal. So it was May 23rd of 1956, and they were working late, but the wind started kicking up. All of a sudden, just turned around, boom, and cuts come right out of the northeast, which is the worst on Michigan. And at two o'clock in the morning, this thing decides to turn over. A guy cable that holds the bucket broke, and the bucket swung all the way over, and that's about 30 tons being shifted to one side. Fireman told me, he said, Jerry, get the hell out of here. It's time to go. So we jumped into the water. Finally come up and I turn and look in the bottom of that dredge is right there, going over. And it rolled right over and went down. The crew of 19 had no opportunity to launch their, their uh, lifeboat, and uh, nine of the 19 perished as a result. Nine were killed, 10 were saved, uh, and two were never found. Till this day, they've never found them. Was a, one of the oilers and a second cook. When I got back to Chicago, I went to a couple of wakes of some of the guys that, and the one wife said, why the hell wasn't it you and not my husband? And I went, whoa. <laughs> that was sad. How do you answer that back, you know? But I always say, is, we're sorry. You know, it's just one of those things. Sorry for your loss. I started diving because I had this, uh, I just wanted to know it was on the bottom where I couldn't see the bottom. I'd walk out on my grandfather's pier as a little kid and I'd look through the water and you could see the ripples in the sand. And you wondered, what, well, what's over here where it's six feet deep and I can't see the bottom? I image shipwrecks and I make it so that everybody else who doesn't get to dive on them gets to see what they look like. So sometimes I paint them, sometimes I draw them. Uh, a lot of times it's digitally on the computer. Car Ferry is a, a pretty great wreck to dive from a dive standpoint. It's got such a great history. No one knew um, where the car ferry in Milwaukee was. It disappeared in October of 1929. It headed out, it got three miles out of the port, and it headed north into 40, 50 mile an hour winds, um, and it was never seen again. We 
We went and uh, we were looking specifically at archaeological evidence on the bottom so that we could answer that very question of how the ship went down. Many people do feel that when you mention the name car ferry that it was designed to transport automobiles across, but these particular vessels were designed to be able to roll sets of rail cars aboard and transport them across. They were owned by the individual railroad companies. And what we discovered was that uh, the rail cars had broken loose. There were a number of uh, rail cars that were off the tracks, that were sideways within the hull. So when those cars loosened and uh, started riding around within the, the hull in the waves, one broke through the side of the hull, pushing it out. Um, and that eventually led to uh, the sinking of the ship. So much water came in. It's like a war zone. It's just a big, uh, on the outside, it's, it's starting to cave in on itself and stuff like that. And you see torn apart rail cars and you see torn apart metal and sheet metal. And then the bow is kind of starting to separate from the rest of the ship. And, all that. and then uh, a ways off of the bow section is the pilot house, which is still standing on the bottom. You can still see the words Milwaukee written on it. There's always this con conflict as to how many people were lost and because there were no survivors, there was no one to interview really to be able to address how many people were actually aboard. And really because um, some people didn't report because they didn't feel that the ship was actually gonna go out that day. So there's really no way of telling exactly how many people were lost, um, but we know that it was a quite substantial disaster in Wisconsin history. One of the few visible signs of the tragedy was a um, lifeboat and uh, addition of some bodies. And one of the lifeboats was found with, with four of the sailors uh, with their life jackets on. So it tells you that they were able to get to a lifeboat, but that the conditions were so rough that they just were unable to survive. Amongst the debris in the lifeboat was a message case. And inside the message case was a note, sort of a note in a bottle. These message cases were standard issue to vessels of the time. And um, that indicated the exact time of loss of the ship because uh, the note was written and on the note it said, you know, this is in the hand of the purser. Um, it was substantiated that it was on the letterhead of the Grand Trunk Line and uh, so it was authenticated. It's always sad when not a soul makes it off of a shipwreck and that, that adds something to the, uh, to the experience of diving it. You know, we don't have pretty fish and we don't have reefs. We have shipwrecks, and that's, there's no place in the world that's got more better preserved historic wrecks than the Great Lakes. These are some pictures of uh, Captain Ed as he was known in the family. Edward was a captain, and he spent 45 years as a car ferry captain on the Great Lakes. This was from the Milwaukee Journal in 1938, talking about my great-grandfather, Edward E. Martin. The Milwaukee was purchased by the Grand Trunk in 1908, and Captain Martin came to service as a wheelman. He became second mate in 1909 and first mate in 1912, and in 1920, he succeeded the late Captain Thomas Trail as master of the Grand Haven. Mainly, you know, he had been serving on the Milwaukee for a number of number of years. And in 1927, he got commissioned to be on the Madison. And I'm just convinced that if he hadn't received that commission, which was his first captainship, that he would have been on the Milwaukee and would have gone down with the Milwaukee. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if that was the case. Hurry. 
we're going to. The wreck. Let's see. 3.3 nautical miles. Of course, is that jump over that crease in the chart there. Columbus had the same problem. 091.5. Now we are just outside of the main gap. This is the main gap between the Milwaukee Harbor and Lake Michigan. Our goal is the Prince Willem, which is about three nautical miles offshore, and we'll be sampling every mile on the way out. So the Seki gave us what, 10.5? No, nine. Nine, and the other side? Other side, 6.7. 6.7. So the quagga mussels uh, started invading in Lake Michigan around 2003 uh, in a substantial rate. And uh, when you see the shipwreck, you'll start noticing that in between the mussels, now you can have algae. So the algae are going to be also attaching to there. And what happens is that you have organic matter now depositing into your shipwreck, it starts degrading it as well. So very slowly, but you start changing the characteristics of the surfaces. Three, two, one, sample. 12, 10, 50, number 10. Now we're going to deploy a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, that we will use to collect samples from the bottom. We'll also use it to survey the shipwreck and see what kinds of changes have occurred since last time we were here. Here we are looking at the edge of the Prince Willem and uh, we're near a railing and you can see that the surfaces are largely encrusted with a growth which is mostly mussels. There are several ways in which the animals alter the shipwrecks and in the case of a shipwreck any alteration is permanent. Stressed by currents for example during a storm and pulled off they will pull a small piece of wood along with them. Most of the shipwrecks in Lake Michigan are completely covered with quagga mussels. And that is really causing the breakdown of the shipwrecks. Um, it's become accelerated. Really, our understanding of those ships also develops over time as new technology becomes available to us. We try to use that to really understand how these ships are, to monitor their, their status, and then also to protect them for ge future generations to come uh, visit and enjoy. kind of watch the weather. I'm very conscious of weather. And I'll notice something and I'll say, ah, storm coming up. It's gonna get tough on the Great Lakes. Then I think about them seamen. There's nothing there that we could find anymore. You would have to be buried or gone by now. But you still have that respect and you still have to be careful. Our job really is to remember those victims, the people that really dedicated their lives. This was a place that they worked, this was a place that they lived, and in many cases it was a place that they lost their lives. And so remembering them and uh, being able to tell their stories is very important. There's been just this, a lot of attention back to Lake Michigan, and I think what that makes us do is try to look back on the past and be able to look and see why Milwaukee was built. I think it's really important to understand how Milwaukee became, from a Milwaukee perspective, how we were so dependent on water to begin with. Today we're very recreation focused. We have a beautiful waterfront for, for that. 
But as the Dennis Sullivan, for example, sailing out of Discovery World, the three-masted schooner, tries to remind us. Those masts, those sails were common. I mean, they were the way people first came here, um, how goods first got here. And water as transportation is, I think it's a timeless concept. We'll wrap up this week's show here at the Wave Tank, which simulates the wave action on the Great Lakes. To learn more about Discovery World and this week's other features, log on to milwaukeepbs.org and search local programs for Outdoor Wisconsin, or visit the Milwaukee PBS Facebook page. I'll be at the Wisconsin Fishing Expo February 28th through March 1st at the Alliance Energy Center in Madison, so stop by our booth and say hello. Well, next time we'll learn about a tunnel that helps turtles and other critters safely cross a busy highway. Elizabeth Kramer checks out Wild West Days in Viroqua, and I'll join the Voss family for a fishing outing on a pond in Fond du Lac County. Waving goodbye from the wave tank here at Discovery World, I'm Dan Small. Join us again next week for Outdoor Wisconsin.